the mic picking up? Can you hear me okay? Good. Just want to thank Kim and the Butte Civil War Archives. It's, this is an amazing institution. I know you know how lucky Butte is to have this institution here and the important work it does. Love partnering with the archives whenever I can and coming down to Butte whenever I can. You can see that I work for the University of Notre Dame. That's a little bit confusing because I spend most of my time in Montana. From Great Falls, live in Helena. So when I drove down here today, I dropped my son off at Jefferson High School in Boulder, had breakfast in Basin. Like, I'm not from Indiana, from, from Montana. So this is, this is part of an ongoing project, and you can see the fruit of that project up here in my book, The Middle Kingdom Under the Big Sky. The Middle Kingdom is what China called and calls itself. We know the reference to the big sky but a history of the Chinese experience in Montana. And what I tried to do in that book, and I'm, I'm selling it today, normally it goes for $55, I'm giving it for 40 today. Just, you know, 55 is a pretty big sticker price. Academic presses tend to have a high sticker price, I figure we'll try to knock that down a little bit. But what I try to do in this book is tell the history of Montana's Chinese whenever I can in their own words, through translation of documents like you see here, that are housed at the Montana Historical Society, but are central to Butte. So in the mid to late 80s, they were salvaged from the Maywa building, not yet the Maywa Society, not yet the Maywa Museum, because the building was dilapidated, possible leaks, possible arson, just danger to these precious historical documents made them precarious. And so some people took the, the ownership to try and figure out what to do to preserve these documents. And they tried with the archives first, and the archives wasn't yet in a position where it could preserve these documents. So they went north to Helena, and the Montana Historical Society preserved these documents in about 1987-88, and then forgot about them until about 2010. When I happened across these large collections of documents, all in Chinese, at that time I was teaching in Shanghai, China, but living in the summer months in Montana. So I was perfectly positioned to try and have these documents translated for the first time ever. And those documents and their translations and the interpretations of these family histories, central to view, are featured in my book. But I also try to explain the history of Montana's Chinese through a couple of different lenses. I'm not the first person to know about the Chinese experience in Montana. I think, though, normally when people tell this story, they maybe are experts in Montana history, or experts in world history. And I, I wanted to try and bring those two things together. So understand Chinese and world history and understand Montana history as much as I, I could. So that's what the book features. And anything that fit those two lenses in their own words or from a global perspective, I put into that book. But not everything fit into the manuscript. And so I had some things that I call manuscripts. <laughs> things that I wanted, I knew that there was a story there and I wanted to chase down later on uh, because it was intriguing but didn't quite fit the narrative structure of the book. And so today is one of those manuscripts. I've got a couple of other projects going on on that same vein. So I'm originally from Great Falls, Montana. It's the only city or town in Montana that banned the Chinese from settling there. And so I've written an article about that. That was kind of a hard one to write. It's under review right now with Montana, the magazine of Western history, because how do you write about an absence? How do you write about a community that wasn't there? It's just a void. So I had to try and get creative to try and tell that story. So that hopefully is coming out. I'm working on a piece on the history of Chinese New Year celebrations across Montana, obviously connecting to the present with the shortest, loudest, coldest parade in Montana, right? Yes. Uh, and then my next project is gonna be looking at Chinese gardens and gardening technologies. And that's an interesting one, I think, because we know that the Chinese came to the west to mine, but they weren't mining back in southern China. They came to build the railroads, but they weren't building railroads back in southern China. Here in Butte, they worked in laundries and restaurants, but the men who did that work hadn't been doing that back in southern China. I'm going to assert that the one continuity of professional experience that they brought here to the west was farming. They knew how to farm, and they brought irrigation technologies, greenhouse, hothouse technologies, fertilizing technologies to the Rocky Mountain region to allow vegetables and food to be produced in quantities and at times of the year that surprised non-Chinese neighbors in the area. So that's what I'm looking at next. So that's kind of the, the manuscripts that I keep chasing on and on. And when my mother-in-law asked, OK, Mark, you wrote a book. Now what's next? These are the answers to that. <laughs> so Montana's Chinese population was, was very large. First territorial census in 1870 had that number at about 10, 12, maybe as high as 15% of Montana's population. Now I need to be careful with my language. 
Montana's non-native population. Okay, so that first territorial census did count them up at a, at a large number. And, Mon and Helena in that year, 1870, was about 21% Chinese. We're talking about a substantial and important Chinese presence early in Montana's history. Dips a little bit, but then peaks in 1890 at just over 2,500 Chinese in the state, by that time the state of Montana. Okay. Butte's Chinese population, the, the closest that I can come to a verifiable corroborated number is about 891 in 1891. It probably was closer to about 1,000 because each of these numbers, each of these census is understandably an undercounting. Many of the Chinese were here illicitly, especially after the Chinese Exclusion Act. They snuck in under less than legal means. And so they probably did want to avoid census takers and government officials. So I think that 890 or so, we could probably round that up to about 1,000. That also does corroborate with what Chinese leaders in Butte's Chinatown said in about 1890. There's about 1,000 Chinese in Butte's Chinatown at that time is what they're saying. There was a mistake in an important piece of historical work or sociological work in the 1950s and 60s done by Butte's own Rose Hum Lee, where she mistakenly ascribes Butte having 2,532 Chinese. Very specific number, right? She mm -hmm. said Butte had 2,532 Chinese. What does the state have at its height? 2,532. I traced her footnote from that book went back to it and she's citing her own dissertation and in that dissertation she does say Montana. So just a little bit of oops, right? And sometimes we'll hear that number, 2,500 Chinese in Butte. I think 1,000 is enough to still be the Rocky Mountain region's largest Chinatown. So it's an important community. Unfortunately for the Chinese across the West, other places featured a lot of frequent violence against the Chinese communities. So we see evidence of either massacres or forcible expulsion, and these red dots are, are areas where that happened. California was rife with anti-Chinese rhetoric that simmered into anti-Chinese violence. Most specifically in California in 1871 in Los Angeles, there was a massacre of a number of the Chinese residents of Los Angeles, tragic. And as we go further north, in the state of Washington, or the territory of Washington, Chinese did not have a good experience there. <clears throat> expelled from Tacoma in 1885, expelled from Seattle in 1886. You can see this primary source here. Who is one of the people calling for the expulsion? The mayor. So you've got some officials, some white officials, trying to expel the region's Chinese community and succeeding in that, sadly, to a large degree. Further south in Oregon, you see the sites of violence or at least anti-Chinese rhetoric that moved towards expulsion in Oregon there. This one here, this is a, a stone that was laid in 2010 at this place here on the Oregon-Idaho border, and it commemorates the massacre of about 30 Chinese people who were massacred for their gold. And sadly, this example, if you expand it, is pretty common. Nobody was ever brought to justice for that crime against the Chinese. That's going to be important for our talks later on. This is done in English, Chinese characters, and Nez Pierce, the three kind of groups that had occupied that area. Mm -hmm. So things were good in California, things were good in Washington, things were not good in Oregon. You keep moving in, you see sites of violence against the Chinese in Idaho. South of us, sadly, in Wyoming and Colorado. In Colorado's, in Denver's Chinatown in 1880, the Chinese were expelled forcibly from Denver's Chinatown, and Chinatown was burned. And then most tragically, in September 1885, in Rock Springs, Wyoming, about 28 Chinese coal miners were killed uh, with very little justice meted out to the people who perpetrated those murders. So ac across the American West, wherever the Chinese were found, sadly, anti-Chinese rhetoric was present, and often that simmered into anti-Chinese violence. Yet, Montana, thankfully, has no instances of mass violence or effective exclusion of Chinese Montanans. The Great Falls example is, I think, the one case. There were... Uh, Isolated cases of maybe a murder here or an arson attack here, but no mass bloodshed and no mass expulsion. Okay, why? What's going what to account for that? Cheap labor. Cheap labor. Cheap labor everywhere, though. I mean, our condi conditions in Montana aren't terribly different from Idaho, Colorado, Wyoming. 
the labor conditions, the times that we're talking about, the extractive industries of mining, lumber, or anything like that. The high immigrants. High, high number of immigrants. I would argue every state and every territory in the American West is a high number of immigrants. And, and you say, and what, what you kind of imply by that is if you're an immigrant yourself, maybe you look with more empathy on another immigrant community. Sadly, uh, that wasn't the case. Much of this anti-Chinese rhetoric in California was by Irish Americans and Irish immigrants, right? And they're competing for jobs on the same rung of, of the economic niche. So it's, it's difficult to prove why that is. Montana conditions were not radically different than any of the other territories or states that we're looking at. And so what I'm trying to do today is try to look at maybe when it was closest to boiling over into violence. And were there individuals or groups or circumstances that prevented that violence? The violence is always simmering just underneath the surface. Sadly, in these other regions, it boiled. Montana, it didn't. And so I'm looking today at one example, and maybe even one individual, who maybe stopped a Rock Springs type event in Montana, or a Denver uh, burning of Chinatown type event in Montana. Can we pinpoint it to one person? Maybe, maybe, we'll see, we'll see. So our, our circumstances in Butte are this. We're in Butte, 1880, 1881. Butte's Chinese community is only about 200. At this point in time, it hasn't yet reached its peak. And the context is this. Wood is in great supply in Butte. In Butte. You can see 500 wood choppers and haulers are needed, 3,000 cords of wood. What's a cord of wood? 128. Yeah. 128. Four by four by eight. Okay, so it's a, a measurement of wood. Why would Butte need this amount of wood, this wood in this, these quantities? Timber for the mines, okay? Shore up the mines. Smelters. Smelting. smelting. It's really about smelting at this point in time. Coal is not readily available, and so this wood is going to be important for smelting and heating houses. And the guys out chopping the wood know how to play on people's emotions. The winter of 1880, 1881 was one of the worst in Montana's history. Temperatures dipped as low as 40, 54 degrees below zero. So bad that across the American West, Laura Ingalls Wilder actually wrote about this winter in one of her, her novels about the West. So it's a horrific cold, dangerous winter. And you've got these wood choppers out there harvesting wood. And so after that winter, they remind people of this. No doubt the people of Butte and Walker will enjoy their nice, warm houses and stoves during the past terrible long winter. These are white wood choppers. We haven't yet introduced the Chinese. Little dreaming that the poor men in the mountains chopping the very wood which makes their homes warm and comfortable were working from daylight to dark over waist deep in snow and not making more than a few cents per day. This was in the summer of 81. So these guys who've been doing this dangerous, horrifically cold work are now trying to remind people of the important role they served and they're trying to unionize. And so they formed the Bull Run, Hail Columbia, Pilgrim, Gulch, Wood Haulers and Wood Choppers Union. <laughs> little wordy, little wordy, right? And what they're gonna try and fight for are certain rates in certain regions where they're harvesting the wood. In Bull Run, they're gonna ask for $2 per cord. Pilgrim Gulch, $1.75, and yeah. Hale Columbia, $1.50 per quart. Why the differences? Distance, distance, distance and terrain. Yeah, yeah, difficulty of actually getting to it. And here, you can quite clearly see on this map where those locations are, right? <coughs> this is a map from the archives. I gotta zoom in a little bit. But it's definitely locating us in Butte. And here is Hale Columbia and the Bull Run Gulch. So you can see Walkerville, Meterville here. And so up just north. Just drove past it this morning. Steep mountains, difficult conditions. So they're trying to unionize and collectively agree for a rate that they will produce uh, the cords of wood. Now the cords of wood, they'd be paid maybe two dollars a dollar quarter, whatever it is. But by the time it gets to Butte, the smelters and houses, housing needs, are going to be buying it for more, right? And so they're trying to use that horrific winter of 1880, 1881, and their need for wood to try and play on people's emotions, reminding them how cold it was, and you would have frozen to death if it wasn't for us. To be honest, though, the wood was needed for heating homes, but was much more needed for this mm -hmm. smelting. This is the Colorado and Montana smelter down kind of on the flats. It's a, kind of a pretty picture of it, a drawing of it there. A little bit of smoke emanating. This uh, gives you a little bit more likely understanding. <laughs> And so this, they were doing a process here called heap roasting. Heap roasting. They dig pits, 
They lay down wood, lay down ore, lay down wood, lay down ore, lay down wood, light it all on fire, and burn for two to three weeks. Okay. As long as a city block, as wide as a city street, and as tall as a man would these heaps be. Each heap burned for two to three weeks, and it consumed about 200 cords of wood. Now, obviously, let off horrific smoke and the toxins from the oxidization process that's happening with the ore, but that's what was needed to release the ore that they wanted from its combined materials. So it's going to need, and actually you can see the, the wood stacked here. It's going to consume a tremendous amount of wood. So what would this wood look like as its harvest? This is over in Anaconda in 1887. It's about seven years after we're talking about. But look at this just clear cut and just wood stacked as far as the eye can see. How would you get that down to where you need to consume it? Through flumes. Okay. This picture, this next picture is actually much closer to where we're talking about today. This is from the archives here. Woodchopper's harvesting wood for the Colorado smelter. This is about 1885, I think. Okay. Uh, this is about 13 miles south of us right now. And this is where the tent situation will happen. Obviously, it's not winter. But if you look, there's their wood crews just throughout here. Not just this crew here, but just guys throughout harvesting all of this wood. A tremendous amount of wood was needed. It'd be brought in here, and here you see the wood stacked at the Montana, Colorado and Montana smelter. Okay. So this smelter specifically, in 1880, the whole year of 1880, had processed 4,800 tons of ore. I don't know if that's a lot or not. I need some comparative data, right? In January 81, it already had 4,000 tons of ore on hand ready to process. Wow. It's ramping up production. So it's going to need a lot more wood, right? They must have wood. That's going to be good for that wood choppers union. Maybe, maybe. So there's calls for people to go out and harvest this wood. A gentleman named Joel Ketching contracts with the Colorado and Montana smelter to provide 10,000 cords of wood. This is not in that cold winter. This is the next season. So Joel Ketching's got this contract signed. He's got to produce. He's offering the wood choppers $1.56 per cord with a bonus of $500. $500. I don't know when that bonus was paid, like at the end of the contract, I'm not sure. We don't have details on that. How does that accord with what they were demanding north of Butte? Depends where. Depends where. It absolutely depends where. Do you think they're going to be happy in the tone with which I ask that question gives you the answer? <laughs> they're going to ask for more. And so they're going to try to fight for a higher wage couldn't find workers. He could not find wood choppers. Joel Ketching could not find wood choppers to take this contract on to produce the 10,000 cords. And he's in danger of forfeiting this contract. Because you'll remember, these were the rates that the white wood choppers union that had just formed are demanding. That's north of Butte. The conditions down south of Butte look similarly rugged, though, right? It's not like it's going to be terribly uh, easier to do that. However, conditions in 81, 82 undercut the bargaining power of this union. Conditions undercut. Remember that winter of 80, 81? Horribly cold? Winter of 81, 82 is this. Owing to the remarkably fine weather prevailing in and around Butte, the supply of wood at $8 per cord has recently exceeded demand. That's here in town. Okay. The condition of the roads has afforded abundant opportunities for hauling. It's just a lot easier because it hasn't been a hard winter. And so those wood choppers who were hoping for another hard winter, hoping to drive up their wages, their bargaining ability is undercut. And so catching cannot find any white wood choppers he tried, cannot find any white wood choppers to take this contract on. Instead, he uses the Chinese. And here you can see their contract, 81, signed by catching, Charlie X Chung, Gong Wong X Long. What's that X? Yeah, it's their signature. Yeah, so it's a binding contract. He's saying when we're going to do this, $50 bonus, when it's received. And so he contracts with the Chinese. Now, this was not the first time that Chinese wood choppers had been used in the Butte region. Okay? In May of that year, a group of Chinese wood choppers had been out doing their thing, and they'd been run off. All right, May 81, 60 or 70 wrathy, angry white wood choppers swooped down upon the Chinese, and with a persuasiveness rarely equaled, argued that the heathens into a belief 
that the mountains were not healthy for Chinamen. <laughs> all in quotes, all in quotes, all in quotes. Okay. Uh, so we don't know much more about that event. But that almost simmered into violence, don't you think? They're out there doing this job, some people who don't want them to have this work chase them off, and they think they've done it once and for all for good. The mountains are not healthy for Chinamen. Catching and his Chinese partners are working to fulfill this contract, so that thing had happened in May. Now Catching has this other contract with other Chinese woodchoppers, maybe some of the same, who knows? And there's about 40 of them working 13 miles directly south of Butte. In December 81, white woodchoppers up here in Butte decide that they don't like that. Led by this guy who sketches to the right, Chance Harris, he organizes a mob of 215 white woodchoppers. A mob of 215 armed white woodchoppers. And they're going to take matters into their own hands. They get this mob of 216 with Harris together, and they're going to ride 13 miles south and chase the Chinese off. Maybe worse. Maybe worse. I argue this is maybe where the anti-Chinese rhetoric would similar, simmer over into bloodshed, if it weren't for one guy, Constable E.T. Owen. Constable E.T. Owen gets word of this and decides, I've got to do something. I'm a man of the law. He races 13 miles south ahead of the mob, gets between the oncoming mob and the Chinese woodchoppers, and stands down the mob. One guy. Now, maybe he was armed, but there's 216 of them, right? And so Constable Owen is standing there, and when the mob gets there, he did not flinch for a moment from the discharge of his duties. Not only that, he attempted to arrest the ringleaders. Bold dude, right? So this mob's coming down, he says, no, these Chinese have a right to this contract. You're an illegal mob. He, he reads them the riot act. That's just kind of a euphemism in English. No, there's an actual riot act. It's a law, and he says, you are breaking this law. He reads them the riot act, and he says, I'm gonna arrest the ringleaders of this. They laugh at him, right? That's not a legitimate thing that he could probably do. He might get killed in that process. But as he delays, the Chinese woodchoppers have the chance to disperse. And so they, vamoose, they get out of there, and violence is not visited upon them. They disperse, he stands down the mob, they go back to Butte or wherever they go. Owen returns to Butte, he organizes a posse, and he actually does go and arrest the ringleaders of the mob. Man of his word. Right? And so the next day, he brings them in, they're arrested, they've broken laws. What law have they broken? Well, the Riot Act, but also they've interfered with the lawful contract. And the people who would sign that contract have rights. Okay? Now the question is, do they? Do, do those people have rights? That's going to become important. The trial commences, and the question is this. In Montana, can Chinese people get a fair trial? Section 13 of the Montana Criminal Practice Act gives us a hint at this. Chinese were not allowed to testify for or against anybody who's white in a court of law. This was common throughout the American West. The thought process was this, that the Chinese supposedly did not understand the binding nature of an oath. All right. Theoretically, if you swear on a Bible or you swear your word, there's something, uh, if you go against that, if you lie, your eternal soul will be damned type of thing. And they were not Christian and didn't understand that. So we could not trust their testimony in court. Because of course you have to be Christian to testify, wait, <laughs> so you scratch the surface of this and it breaks down a little bit, right? They also thought that the, the intermediary of a translator might not be doing justice to how things are going back because of course you have to speak English to testify, right? No. So you scratch the surface of this and there's a lot of racism right underneath it. But if they can't testify, if they're some of the only witnesses to the crime that is being alleged, is Chance Owen and the other ringleaders of the mob, will they be held uh, accountable for this? Celestial scenes in Montana's court. The average Chinaman, I disagree with this, this statement, right? Obviously on, on a number of, but I also disagree with its veracity. The average Chinaman has about as much of the idea of the sanctity of the oath administered in American court as he has of good cooking. All frequenters of Butte's restaurants which employ Chinese cooks will appreciate fully this comparison. I, I don't agree. There's some good Chinese restaurants here. Thankfully, we still have the Pecan Noodle Parlor, the longest continuously operating Chinese restaurant in all of America. So, but you can see this perspective was very much anti-Chinese. 
And so the question is, will they be allowed their day in court? Well, the judge in this is a guy named Judge J.B. Wilcox. He's from a town that I actually go out to about three times a year, Hudson, Ohio, in between Cleveland and Akron. I work with a school out there. Why is that important? Wilcox is from Hudson, Ohio. It was a hotbed of abolitionist activity. You've heard of John Brown? Mm -hmm. The Brown family had ties and links to Hudson, Ohio. So it's possible that Wilcox was brought up in this radical Republican <laughs> stand up for equal rights, stand up for racial rights in an African American context, and maybe he's going to transpose that out here to the Chinese and the Chinese Americans. We'll see. Here's the indictment against Chance Harris, and you can see the list of witnesses Charlie Chung. Remember Charlie X. Chung, who'd signed that contract? Not only is Charlie Chung going to testify, he was there, he signed this contract, his rights had been infringed upon, but look at the witness list. E.T. Owen, okay. Aga, Aha, Asun, Ayo, Yon, Ahi, Awan, and then J.H. Oliver, he's the interpreter. Mm -hmm. Now I will say, this is one of the reasons doing this work on the Chinese is so difficult. These are not their names, mm -hmm. and yet official record keepers took that to mean those were their names. Mm -hmm. In the culture that most of the Chinese who came to America are from, ah is a diminutive expression of familiarity amongst friends. And yet census takers and record keepers often took that down as their name. So there's no way that these were their birth given names. It's more of shorthand between people who are familiar. Now this J.H. Oliver, he's a white guy, he's the interpreter. How did he learn enough Chinese to be an interpreter? He actually served on steamships going back and forth from San Francisco to Hong Kong long enough that he gained enough Chinese language abilities that he frequently served as interpreters yeah. after this case. But we're going to still see what's Wilcox going to do with this. And so he gives instructions to the jury. As they're prosecuting Chance Harris for violating these, these laws, Judge Wilcox tells the jury, under treaties and laws of the United States, Chinese people are entitled to certain rights and privileges, and one of them is that they're entitled to the protection of life and property under the law to the full and equal extent. I've stopped there, I won't go on just yet. The, the treaties and laws that Wilcox is mentioning here, well, the law might be the 14th Amendment. You can see some of that language here, full and equal extent, right? Equal protection of the law. You don't have to be a citizen to, get, to benefit from the rights of the, the, the guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. But the treaty is the Burlingame Treaty of 1868. We don't yet have the Chinese Exclusion Act, it's just a year before that. The Burlingame Treaty of 1868 welcomed Chinese workers in to build the railroads. The American West is resource rich and labor poor. When the railroad contract was given, they couldn't find workers. They opened it up to Chinese migrants to come in, legally protecting them with the American law under treaty-bound obligations. Wilcox knows this and says, yeah, they've got rights. Maybe not under Section 13 of Montana's Criminal Practice Act, but federal rights supersede that. So he said, under the Burlingame Treaty, they've got rights, and we're going to let them testify and have their day in court. So Wilcox continues with the jury as though they were bona fide actual citizens of the United States. And in this case, the offense charged is no less an offense under the law because the persons on whom the violation is charged to have been committed were Chinese. <clears throat> Treat them as if they weren't Chinese, they're just in court, they're, they're, we're alleging that their rights have been infringed upon. Now that as though they were bona fide actual citizens, Chinese people in, the Ameri in America at this time period could not become American citizens. What's that process called when an immigrant becomes a citizen? Naturalization. Naturalization. They, could, they, they were not afforded that right. The only way for a, Chinese, a person of Chinese ethnicity to become a citizen was to be born on American soil. Now that's kind of difficult in Montana because there's not many Chinese women. In 1900, a little bit later than this, the gender ratio is 40 Chinese men for every one Chinese woman. Okay. So it's very, very difficult for Chinese families to become Chinese American families. Now you might say, well Mark, a Chinese man does not have to intermarry with a Chinese woman, of course. Actually in Montana, they did. There's something called the Anti-Miscegenation Act. That's a little bit later, 1909 to 1953, but they could not marry outside of their race. So it was made, in an immigration sense, very difficult for Chinese women to get in, and then it was made very difficult for Chinese to marry outside of their race intentionally so that Chinese families did not become Chinese-American families. But Wilcox is saying, I don't care. 
you're going to treat them as if they're bona fide citizens of the United States. And so if this had been committed on anybody else, then if they had been a white man, full citizens of the U.S., the law of the land in this case is equal and alike, and the jury should so consider it in this case. I think this is an equally bold stance by Judge J.B. Wilcox, as was E.T. Owens racing down 13 miles south and interdicting the, uh, the mall. So Harris goes on trial. What he could face is $500 fine and one to three years in the territory of prison. $500 nowadays, I'd love to have it in my pocket right now. What does that mean back in that time period? We're talking about $20 per dollar now. So it's a considerable amount, right? And he could be thrown in, in the prison for this. He is found guilty. He's sentenced to a hundred dollar fine. Mm -hmm. What does that indicate about maybe the jury's sympathies in this case? Mm -hmm. They weren't necessarily sure that uh, he had done anything wrong, but by the letter of the law put out by Judge J. B. Wilcox, they saw his point. And Butte was divided on this. Some people at the time said this is a crime and needs to be prosecuted. Other people are saying you got to be kidding me. We got to run out the Chinese because they're they're working too cheap. Let's get rid of them. So Butte is definitely uh, split on this. The Braves stand by Constable E.T. Owen, I believe likely prevented violence that could have been on the scope of Rock Springs or the L.A. Massacre of Chinese in 1871 or something like that. We can't know. We can't know. But in my opinion, in my looking at this history for the last 15 years or so, I think this is where it got closest, going from a simmer of anti-Chinese rhetoric to a boil of anti-Chinese violence. Judge Wilcox stood up for their rights in the U.S. and the equal protection. It signaled broader protection, saying that maybe they will be heard in court. Maybe they'll be allowed to testify. What happens to Chance Harris? He could, uh, he could kind of bond himself out from this. He decides, I think he doesn't have the money. And so he just stays in jail for a longer period of time. And mathematically, that paid for his debt. He leaves Silverbow County, goes north of Jefferson County and continues to chop and haul wood. I don't know that he's in this picture, but I like this picture from Boulder in 1890. Right? You get a sense of just packing wood on these mules here uh, to try and deliver to the mines and smelters and things like that. Sadly, right after this time period, so we're looking at December 1881, the trial went into February 1882. Sadly, things became more dangerous for the Chinese across the American West. Just after this, in May, Federal legislation is passed to try and stop Chinese from coming into the nation. This is the Chinese Exclusion Act. Often misinterpreted that all Chinese were barred. No, just workers. Okay, if you were a merchant, you could still come in. If you were a diplomat, if you were a student, uh, things like that were still allowed in. But remember that 1868 Berlingame Treaty? Welcome workers in, and now all of a sudden they're being barred. At this point, many Chinese decided to gain illicit entry because they felt like this was an immoral exclusion of them. And the money being earned here in Butte was life-saving for families in poverty-stricken southern China. The area of southern China they came from had undergone floods, famines, droughts, civil war, rebellions, epidemics. Life was precarious and tenuous there. Money earned here was keeping people alive in southern China. So they could really care less about a law that seemed to switch and shift with the wind. Right after this time period, some people did not think that the law went far enough and took the, the, the inspiration from the federal law to block the Chinese on a, the ground level to try and take actions against the Chinese. And so here we have in September 1885, the Rock Springs Massacre down at the coal mines in Rock Springs, where 28 Chinese are killed, very little justice meted out. In November 85, Tacoma, 200 Chinese are expelled. February 1886, Seattle, 300 Chinese are expelled. And then that massacre that I mentioned on the border of Oregon and Idaho. So things were not good in the 1880s to be Chinese in the American West. In Montana, 1885 was a particularly bad year. From April to December, and specifically October to November. And if you'll remember, September 1885 was the Rock Springs Massacre. It reverberates around the West. People know about it, definitely and some people take some inspiration from it. And so, particularly tense in Anaconda, Butte, Dillon, Deer Lodge, Glendale, Nyhart, there were anti-Chinese boycotts, trying to economically cut off their lifeblood and hope to drive them from the region. My home city of Great Falls, at exactly this time period, September 1885, began uh, a ban on Chinese from settling there. There was attempted arson 
on the Chinese temple here in Butte. And so things could possibly escalate from this rhetoric to expulsion or mass violence. Of these, of these 1885 boycotts, one in particular reminds me of E.T. Owen and Judge J.B. Wilcox. And what we have are key instances of white allyship. White Montanans standing up for their Chinese neighbors so that nothing bad happens to them. Oftentimes in history, I think we, we, we see it in a black and white metaphor, good and bad. There were people who took noble stands. In Deer Lodge, October 1885, this flyer goes up. The Chinese must go. Knights of Labor of America, after November 15, 1885, we will withdraw our patronage from all persons who still employ and patronize the Chinese and institute a vigorous boycott against the Chinese and anybody who spends money at a Chinese restaurant, laundry, or garden. This was hung on the, the night of October 30th. It didn't have any signatures on it. It had the Knights of Labor as a signature, but it was anonymous and hung in the middle of the night. <coughs> And so the city fathers of Deer Lodge oppose this boycott. They say, no, not, not Deer Lodge. We're not going to allow this boycott. And they didn't oppose it anonymously, like it had been instituted anonymously. This is what they did when they wrote and said, we're not going to stand for this boycott. Wow. They all said, no, I'm not going to stand. I can't see these names very great. But O'Neill said he's not going to stand. Miller said he's not going to stand. Ben, Evans, Owings, Irvin, Brown said, no, not in our town. I don't believe that they had any love for their Chinese residents of Deer Lodge, the language that they use is, if you could boycott this community one day, what's to stop you from boycotting Norwegians or Irish or Catholics or Protestants coming up? And so they stood against this boycott, and it was never enacted in Deer Lodge. Sadly, in those other areas that I mentioned, it was enacted. Anaconda uh, did succeed, sadly in my opinion, um, evicting most of the Chinese from Anaconda at this time period. This 1885 boycott in Butte happened, but it didn't have a major effect. There were key moments where violence was imminent. White allies stood up for rights and laws and contracts. But I also don't want to just empower the white allies in these examples. Chinese Montanans stood up as well. They stood up for their rights and they fought back through rhetoric, through persuasive writing, through different things like that. In Helena in 1866, there was an attempt to boycott all the Chinese laundries in Helena. Okay. And it looked like it was going to go through. Chinese residents of Helena who owned these laundries wrote a newspaper article and said, hey, we follow all your laws. We pay all our taxes. We want to carry ourselves as good, law-abiding citizens of Montana territory. Of course, they couldn't be citizens, but they're saying, we're going to follow all your laws. They said, let us learn an honest living by the sweat of our brow. And they signed their names. That did dissipate the boycott, the laundry boycott in 1866 in Helena. In 1892, there was a major uh, revamping of the Chinese Exclusion Act with much more restrictions on who could come in, and the Chinese fought against that. Okay, they didn't succeed necessarily, but they showed solidarity, community strength, and advocacy for their own uh, rights. Most specifically, though, when the Chinese stood up is here in Butte in 1896-97. There was the most serious boycott of Butte's Chinese community at the time. Uh, and gardens, laundries, restaurants, things like that were going to be boycotted. There would be so-called walking delegates outside the restaurants, intimidating anybody from going in. If there were patrons inside, they'd be dragged outside and told not to come back. Chinese delivery boys, taking laundry or food or whatever it was, were followed on their routes. And their white patrons would get a knock on the door and say, don't patronize the Chinese. So it was a concerted effort to try to cut off the economic lifeblood of the Chinese community and force them out of view. They obtained a very powerful lawyer named Wilbur Fisk Sanders, one of the founding fathers of Montana, and the vigilante lore, came down from Helena and represented them in court. They passed the hat in Chinatown and collected $20 from everybody who wanted to fight this boycott, and that's where we get the number of about 1,000 people contributed. There was about 1,000 Chinese in, in Butte's Chinatown at that time. They paid Wilbur Fisk Sanders and he fought for their rights and they won. So they were beginning to use the American legal system. They were not passive. These stories that sometimes you hear about the Chinese were so oppressed that they lived in tunnels underground. No, no. They were bold and active, advocating for rights that they believed they deserved and winning key victories. In chapter four of my book, I talk about a, an interesting example where they actually formed an armed militia here in Butte, training with old uh, Spanish-American war rifles and trained by some old Spanish-American war veterans. 
and shooting live ammunition down on the flats, target practicing, that's not living in tunnels underground. That's a pretty bold statement. Now, their militia had nothing to do with American politics. It had more to do with Chinese politics. They were planning on going back and wresting control of the government from this one pretender who had risen, and they were going to put back in charge the rightful emperor that they were more akin to. But that is empowerment, that's boldness, that's them standing up, but without the aid of those white allies in key moments, I think things could have gotten very bad like they did elsewhere. Thankfully, they didn't here in Montana. For these stories and more, Check out my book. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. very good. I've driven down there to where I think it happened, and there's still stumps. I want them to be from 1881. <laughs> I don't know the environmental nature of it, but I've, I've driven down in that area. It looks like this area. So I think I've been where this happened. I don't know how much is left from what happened. What's the... Uh... Were the Chinese woodchoppers ever given a chance to join the wood union? No. I, I wouldn't think not. No. Good question. Were the Chinese woodchoppers ever given a chance to join the, the, the union? Very much no. I do have what I think is the first example of a Chinese man in Butte joining a union. Uh, they were barred from mining in the underground mines for about 60 years. You, you, we've all seen that picture, uh, no smoking in how many languages, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. it, it's not in Chinese. They were not allowed to work in the underground mines. In chapter eight, I go into a gentleman who came to Butte in 1933. He was 14 years old. And I believe he, was, he worked in laundries at first. I believe when he got a job at the Mountain Con Mine in, in 1940, he was the first person of Chinese ethnicity to work in the underground mines. And in a diary that I have from him, he talks about how he joined the labor union. And he went to union meetings and things like that. That's a pretty big move. Why would he be able to work, join the union and work in the underground mines in 1940? War. war. We're not yet involved in the war, of yeah. course, but war production of copper was absolutely needed. Um, so he's down there, he, and in his diary he talks about a couple of things. He says, I share my lunch with them, and they share their lunch with me, and they, we think each other's food is kind of strange and stuff like that. He's a, he gets into an accident with his Finnish partner, and there's an accident report. Uh, they also, they left him to mine this one slope, uh, Stoke, is it Stoke? Uh, and the, the, his overseers went, went off a little ways. And when they came back, he had worked too hard. They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Come on. Let's slow it down here. So he's kind of getting the, the inside scoop on how to do things. Did you, or have you looked at how the Chinese were treated in Western Canada compared to at the same time period? Like, did they have the same kind of... Um, trouble and exclusion in yeah. Western Canada? Good question. So how were they treated in Western Canada? Uh, very good question. Quite similarly, in terms of exclusionary policies, I don't know of expulsion or violence necessarily, uh, but I do know that there was a lot of cross-pollination of political ideas. So this, this mm -hmm. militia that they formed, the exiled Chinese leader who's behind that comes first. After being exiled from China, he comes to Victoria, British Columbia and then he does travel across the American West. We've got pictures of him here. He went on a tour. So my guy who got the first job in the underground mine in Mountain Con in 1940, he's not the first Chinese person in an underground mine in Butte, because this diplomat who comes in 1905 takes a tour of the original mine. And we've got a picture of him outside the original mine after he's come up, because what he's trying to do is westernize China, so he wants to look at modern education, modern military, modern mining systems to take back and help China advance. So that, he, that was definitely a British Columbia based group first, as it then spread to the American West. There was exclusion. I don't know how much violence there but, was. Yeah, that's what I was wondering if there was as, as much violence. I don't, I don't think it was probably pleasant. No. I, don't know, I don't know if it rose to the level of violence like we saw on the border of Oregon and Idaho or yeah. Rock Springs. Other questions? Uh, my family has owned property out in, in the Basic Creek area since 1880. And, and there's a China Gulch, yeah. and I know where the uh, Chinese boarding house was out there. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. my Colorado smelter had a flume running from out there. Oh, wow. And uh, I've got pictures of that, and they're the only pictures I've ever yeah. seen of it. So it might be on your spot. How high up is it? Uh, the, so the, let me jump back to this one. Well, I, that, that picture, you know, they're, they're saying 10,000 feet. Yeah, I didn't buy that. No, Red Mountain is 10,000 feet. Uh, this seemed like an exaggeration. It, it could have been anywhere out there because they clear cuts. 
And I have run into back in the woods where they had those piles and they never took them yeah, out. Yeah, sure. The piles are still sat there. Yeah. You know, so they, they, they clear cut everything. I can't yeah. hold them yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. I'd love to see those pictures if you want to share them or talk more about oh, that location. Yeah, yeah. Wayne, I think you need to take us on a field trip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, ar the archive staff specifically. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, thank you for sharing your information with us. You mentioned something about a Chinese place of worship here in you. Yeah, yeah. So, is that located? Uh, yeah, let me. Well, it was on uh, West Galena, just off Maine. Um, okay. in, in Chinatown, so about a, a block north, uh, a block northeast of the Meiwa, I would say. Uh, there were three Chinese temples. The first Chinese temple was built right about where the town pump headquarters is, um, when Mar where Maryland and Maine meet, right about there. Obviously nothing left of it there. Uh, and then at, I think what happened is, I think there were Chinese in Butte before there was a Chinatown in Butte. Right? And so they had some elements of things that would be important culturally, and then as Chinatown solidified and concretized, so to speak, up here in Uptown, then they moved the temples up there. So there was that one, and then it, it kind of just crept uphill, and that last one was West Galena and Maine, right in there. Uh, that's the one, I've gotten a long interview where a guy goes in and interviews the temple keeper of the Joss House, or the temple, the Chinese temple. This temple keeper, this is 1899, he claims he was born in 1792. He's 107 years old. I think he's having a little bit of fun with the reporter. Um, but he tells a good story. He says he came up here from Utah with a group of Chinese. They were attacked by Indians in Yellowstone. Only three survived. Something about how when the Indians looked at him, they saw that he didn't have any teeth, and so they let him go. Um, uh, but then he came up to the Silverboat area, he says, and he was just kind of living in a tent and trying to mine and things like that. And then in about 1867 or 68, some white guys showed up, were surprised to see him. So he tells this long story of, of his time in Montana. I want it to be true. I haven't been able to corroborate it at all. He was having some fun. Other questions? Can you go to the oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Wait. Go ahead, Joe. Can you go to the mule picture? Of uh, up in Boulder? Yeah. Yeah. What I was looking at is it looks split. And I, some of the files that are coming across in the woods that are made from the snow. Yeah, and stuff yeah. We're all split, too. Yeah. And I was surprised to see them split because it's not easy to split a piece of wood that long. No, and I wonder, I don't know what they're doing with this. I don't know if this is, this is 1890. They stopped the heap roasting uh, method by the late 1880s, so I don't think this was probably coming to the heaps here. And the reason they stopped that is, is that there were these things called the smoke wars. It was just so toxic mm -hmm. that people here in Butte said, we can't even raise anything. It's killed everything, and, and the, the wind patterns were killing cows and, and crops and things like that. And so they, you know, then they moved to different smelting areas. I don't know that this was for smelting. This might have been for shoring up mines. They Interesting note that it's it's split though. They yeah. used them for stalls <clears throat> instead of actual you know, cut wood. They would just jam a piece of wood up there and call it stall. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I just like the picture, and I like to think that that Chance Harris, who left Silverboat, went to Jefferson. He's probably one of these guys there, right? Yeah. Other other questions. In your book, you talk about a special census just for the yeah. Chinese. Yeah. Where is that located? Is it? Yeah. Good question. So in 1905, there was this thing called the Special Census of the Chinese in the Montana and Idaho region. Hmm. Now, why would there be a census in 1905? There shouldn't be. Right? This is really not a census at all. It's a document check. It's, a, it's an immigration raid. It's a roust. That 1892 Gary Act that I mentioned that was a strengthening of the Chinese Exclusion Act, it required Chinese in America to carry with them at all times a certificate with their picture on it. It was like a mug shot. If they didn't have the certificate with them, they could be arrested and deported without the ability to provide testimony or, or fight for their rights. Uh, the government, after it instituted that 1892 Gary Act, didn't have a well-funded immigration service. That transferred from one governmental department to another in 1903. And in 1903, it was finally funded. And so that, that agency wanted to go around and check Chinese communities to see if they had that document. That happened in 1905. 
So this special census of Montana and Idaho, I'm, nobody knows about this. I think I'm, I, I don't want to overstate it, but I think there's two historians who have written about this special census. I'm one of them, this other person wrote about it. I, a friend of mine found it in the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Hmm. She sent me a fuzzy picture of this. I had never heard of it. I looked into what it might be. I thought, okay, I've got to fund a trip out to Washington, D.C. and work with this document. I thought, you know, before I do that, let me check the Montana Historical Society. They had it all on microphone. <laughs> and I think I was the only person who'd ever accessed it. So then for six weeks every day, I went to the Montana Historical Society and looked at this document. So it had the person's name, where they were when they registered, when they were required to, the registration number, and then where they were found in 1905 and their occupation. And I looked at this and I saw some patterns. So a lot of them from 1894 to 1905 stayed in Montana. Okay. Some of them left the state, some came in from the state, but the vast majority of the Chinese who were found in 05 had been here in 94. Uh, so that's up, up at the Montana Historical Society. Sadly, Montana Historical Society Research Center and just files are offline for about the next two years mm -hmm. as they're moving to their new, new building. Yeah, but that 05 census was a fascinating document. Yeah. Other questions? I saw a hand up here. I'm just curious if in the future you'll be giving us a presentation on the Chinese gardens in this area? I hope to, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd love to. I, I'm looking at that. Some of my early hypotheses, and, and what you have to do as a historian, you can't go in with your hypothesis in mind and then go find the research, because your research is going to fit your hypothesis. You're going to cherry pick, right? So you've got to survey all the resources you can get your hands on. Think about it, ruminate on it, let it percolate, step back and say, okay, what does this allow me to assert? And what, I, what I'm beginning to find with the Chinese garden situation, what it's allowing me to assert, they did start in Chinatown, but then as land values went up and things like that, they moved to the edge of the city. In Helena that happened, in Missoula that happened, Bozeman that happened, definitely here in Butte that happened. They had been up here, uptown, and then moved down on the flats. And what happened is they were pretty successful, so they had money, and they were aware that from the prying eyes of Chinatown and the law. So they tended to be targeted for attack pretty often. So what I'm seeing quite frequently is ruffians, robbers, hooligans, whatever you want to say, attacking Chinese gardens quite frequently. I think because of that combination, they knew they were successful and had money, and they were far enough from society not to cause a stir. Yeah. Soil, soil and water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and so, I, I'm thinking about their irrigation technologies that they brought, fertilizing technologies that they brought, greenhouse, hothouse technologies that they brought, and what they're bringing to market. And at the time of year that they're bringing it, people are constantly commenting on. I can't believe I've got fresh radishes, fresh turnips, fresh celery, all this stuff from the Chinese. Uh, it is. It's quite interesting too. It seems to be the only or one of the only professions that the Chinese did that the white-controlled newspapers praised. Oftentimes it was Chinese restaurants or laundries or whatever, or dirty and this and that, but they seem so blown away by what the Chinese are bringing in to market that they seem quite impressed by it. I'd love to give a presentation on that when my research is ready. Where, we just where Highway know. 2 and Continental Drive yeah. come yeah. together, those are all Chinese yep. gardens, those mm -hmm. down there. Actually, yeah. those, those were Korean. 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 Later. They were Chinese first and then Korean. The Koreans took them over? That often happened. It happened up in Boulder as well. Um, I've got a map that identifies where the Chinese gardens were in Boulder. And then as the Chinese community, as this happened, let's see, sorry to give you seasickness here, but as this happened, Korean families often took over those. In the Helena Valley, it was Japanese families that took over the Chinese gardens. So there often was that supplanting from Asian communities that, that knew their agriculture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I shop down with my grandma. Yeah, yeah. What do you remember them specializing in? Oh, I. Uh, baby carrots, yeah. onions, leeks. Yeah. Uh, Good yeah, vegetables. You know, the one thing I'm seeing also in this garden, early garden work is I see them growing things that are known to consumers here. I don't see bok choy, I don't see a lot of um, Asian varieties of vegetables. Whereas in Idaho and in California and places like that, I did see reference to that. I haven't yet seen reference to that in Montana. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. How did the Chinese men get their women out here? How did the women come? Yeah, so early on, before the 1882 Exclusion Act, workers could bring wives in. So early on there were some women. 
But even before 1882, there was something called the Page Act, passed in 1875, and that assumed that any Chinese woman coming in was working as a prostitute. Now, there were, there were some Chinese women who worked as prostitutes in the American West, by no means all. And so it was very culturally antagonistic to Chinese culture. But there had been some wives who came in. After 1882, really the only way for a Chinese woman to get in was to be the wife of a merchant. Merchants were allowed to come and go, and they were allowed to bring a wife in. And so then as merchants come in and as families emerge, you do get the first Chinese-American families here. The Hum family here in Butte, the Chin family here in Butte, important Chinese-American families. But on that example, Rose Hum Lee, Rose Humley, famed sociologist, she's touted by many to be the first woman and first Asian American chair of a major academic department at a university. Okay. She was born here in Butte in 1903, thus she should be an American citizen and was. However, what are her marriage prospects? She's got to marry a Chinese man. Are many Chinese men citizens? No. So in the, and I think she gets married in 1922. That's after this act called the Expatriation Act. Expatriation Act was not just targeted at Chinese, it was targeted at immigrants, but it said a woman's citizenship status would follow that of her husband. And so when Rose Hum Lee married a graduate student, I think at the University of Pennsylvania, who was not a citizen, she lost her citizenship. So it's complex, right? And, but, and that was not just against Chinese, but then listen to this, this twist. She eventually gets divorced from him, right? And the government has found that this loophole is inconvenient. So they, they've nixed that expatriation act. But she lost her citizenship. What does she need to do to get it back? Naturalize. 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 She can't naturalize. And so this 10, even though she's born on American soil and should have all the, the benefits that come with that, she's trapped in this in-between status. And it really, I think that psychologically affected Rose Humley quite deeply. Uh, she wrote an important sociological work on Butte's Chinatown. She was seen by many of Butte's Chinatown as somewhat of an outsider and prying too much. But also by white society, she was never seen as acceptable enough. So she's this woman trapped between two worlds. I've read her papers that are down at UCLA, and uh, she's psychologically quite affected by this being trapped between two worlds. Mm -hmm. And by the, by the end of her life, her letters exhibit a deep paranoia. She believes that Chinese tongs are spying on all her letters and conniving against her. And she basically uh, had less than healthy mental health by the end of her life. Mm -hmm. yeah. So not many Chinese women and those who were here had a complicated life. I saw another hand here. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, so what is, what is the history beyond the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act? Did it Dissolved? Did they? Uh, when? When? I just like to know when this yeah, uh, yeah. discrimination ended. Uh, well, I think unfortunately, um, with the attacks on Asian American communities in 2022 and 2023, mm -hmm. many would say it hasn't. Right. Um, by the way, this is a bit of a joke, but I think you'll get it. I saw. I saw last week that Chinese in Montana was trending. I assumed it could only be about my book, right? <laughs> you know, that balloon that floated over, right? So things are complex. Uh, to your question about the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, it only ended in 1943. And the reason it ended in 1943 is we were enemies of the Japanese. China was enemy of the Japanese. It's pretty unsightly to ban an ally from even getting into your country. And so the doors were thrown wide open, right? After the 1943 Magnuson Act, which canceled out the Chinese Exclusion Act, 105 Chinese people were allowed in per year. Jeez. Did I miss some zeros there? 105,000? 105. So for, it was. For how it long? Until uh, 1965 when things really, really? changed. 1952, there were some changes that, that did benefit Chinese immigrants, but it was complex. In chapter 8 of my book, I look at that guy who I said is the first Chinese man to mine in the Mountain Con. He came in as a 14-year-old in 1933, was detained for six weeks in Seattle as they questioned him and compared his answers against family members who'd come in decades before. Uh, he eventually is allowed in, and he's recognized as a citizen through this loophole called derivative citizenship. He said that his father had been an American citizen, and so that citizenship passed down to him. They affirmed that, they said, yes, you can come in, you're a citizen, he comes here to be. His brother, 
whose status should rest on exactly the same claims tries from 1948 to 1958 to get out of war-torn southern China in here to Butte. And that collection of letters, these letters uh, like this that we, we translated from the Montana Historical Society, 250 letters from a brother here in Butte to a brother stuck in Hong Kong, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, trying to get the brother out of harm's way in southern China and into safety here. Goes on for 10 years. At one point, the brother in southern China implores the guy here in Butte, says, hey, this isn't working. You need to find a powerful Westerner, have him be the guarantor of my documents, and have him see what he can do. Our guy in Butte goes to Mike Mansfield to try and move things along. That doesn't work. Wow. Eventually, in 1957, when copper prices tank and people are laid off, I think our guy here in Butte gets laid off. He decides to move to Seattle because he's constantly going back and forth to Seattle to fill up half a day and to give blood tests and whatever the government is asking for to see if that guy really is his brother. He leaves Butte, doesn't come back, and leaves those letters behind. Okay. So he came to Butte in 1933 as a 14-year-old. He died in November of 2000 in really? Seattle. Wow. I'm in touch with his daughter and his son in Seattle. The brother in southern China, should I tell you what happened to him? Yeah. yeah. You gotta buy the book. You gotta buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he, ne he never made it out of southern China. The brothers were never even reasoning. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So to be Chinese in, in the American West was not easy. I think the boldness of their stances combined with bold white allyship in key moments where anti Chinese rhetoric was simmering and could have boiled over, made it a little bit more easy to be Chinese in Montana than in Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, California, Washington, Oregon. Hope you've enjoyed these stories. I like talking about it. I like an engaged audience. Thank you very much.